Hi there, my name is Phil and I'm a senior lecturer in astrophysics and also the program leader for physics with astrophysics at the University of Lincoln. And I want to use this video to show you how you can actually calculate the tidal heating on Jupiter's moon Io. Now, Io is probably the most volcanic place in the solar system, it has lots of volcanoes, which we can actually see, as you can see in this image here. And a lot of that is derived from its tidal heating due to its elliptical orbit and its interaction with Jupiter. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how you can actually calculate that tidal heating that's occurring on Io, or at least get a good approximation for that anyway with what we actually know. So before we do that, let's have a recap of tidal heating. If you haven't seen any of these videos I've done before about tidal heating, then you'll want to kind of pay attention to this. If not, skip past this and go straight to the calculation a bit later on. So tidal heating then. This is the process by which gravitational interactions between a planet or a moon, could actually be a star and a planet, but for this case here, we're going to use a planet and a moon, generates internal heat due to tidal forces. And if the two objects are quite close, then those tides can be quite significant, and that can generally internally heat the planet. So, strong tides cause a tidal locking. We know that because of the moon. That means that the same face always faces towards us. It slows the rotation down of the smaller object so that it actually will rotate once for every orbit. That's the, and the moon is a good example of that. Lots of other moons end up being tidally locked. Some planets that are close to their star also do that. And what happens is the object kind of gets stretched and pulled due to the tides. That causes an internal friction that can heat them up, slows them down until that is no longer in place. That can cause basically a tidal heating as well, but it results in a tidal locking. Now, the closer the objects are, the stronger the tides. Should seem fairly obvious. Our moon is actually moving further out on its orbit, so the tides will get less and less over time. So closer objects, stronger tides. Io is the closest of the Galilean moons, hence it's going to experience the most significant or the largest amount of tidal heating compared to the other Galilean moons. That's why we're going to use it as an example. It's also why it has quite significant volcanoes that we can actually monitor and see. So what happens is basically as it's kind of rotating, the material itself wants to resist that deformation. It's trying to be stretched and squeezed as it's rotating. That obviously resists that. There's some kind of friction there. It doesn't want to do that. And then that slows the rotation. And that lost rotational energy is dissipated as heat in the object. So that's, again, relating to the tidal locking. But that's not the one we're interested in for Io for, for this specific one. We're more interested in what happens on elliptical orbits. So the same thing happens on elliptical orbits. As the object goes around on its orbit, the distance between the two objects changes. So here you've got a planet and a star. When they're at their closest, so at the pericenter, the tides are greatest. The object becomes more elliptical, more ellipsoid in shape. It becomes stretched more. Now, as it goes around on its orbit to the bit where it's the furthest away, that would be the apocenter. That's the furthest distance on the elliptical orbit that separate the two. Tidal forces are the weakest here. So actually the object relaxes back to a more spherical shape. So as it goes around, it kind of gets ellipsoid, then spherical, and that causes the same sort of effect, like a stretching, squeezing, stretching, squeezing. And the material wants to resist that as well in the same manner. Now, what typically happens here is that elliptical orbit becomes more circular. Now, what I've done here is this makes it look like it's actually getting on a shorter orbit. That isn't necessarily the case. This is just a, a visual representation. It depends sometimes that when it becomes more circular, the object might drift further out on a wider orbit because you've lost orbital energy or this, something else has happened because it's actually interacting with the star as well. But anyway, there's going to be an exchange of energy. It could go in, it could go out. The key thing for elliptical orbits is that they become more circular. They become less elliptical. And that orbital energy that is lost due to that is dissipated as heat in the object. So it causes a tidal heating again. So here's Io. 
And there's some volcanoes pointed out for you. So this tidal heating can cause significant volcanic activity. We know that from IO, and we're going to find out just how significant that could be as we work for our calculation. So what we need to do first is start with the gravitational force between two massive objects. So we've basically got Jupiter and we've got Io. So Mj will be the mass of Jupiter, Mio is the mass of Io, and then R is the distance separating them. So this is the gravitational force between those two objects. This is where we're going to start. Now, the tidal force is the gradient of the gravitational force, which we can write as this here. So this is 2g mj times mi uh, io over the distance cubed. So that's the tidal force acting on the object. So we already know, because I just mentioned it, that the during the orbit of io, it's going to get stretched and squeezed. So we know that's going to occur. So we know that the tidal force throughout the orbit is not going to be static. It's going to vary. So it's then going to basically vary during the orbit. But anyway, the total force experienced by Io is the product of the tidal force, that's the force per unit distance, and Io's diameter. Again, that's the distance across the actual body itself, because actually the tidal or yeah the force on the opposite side of Io from Jupiter is not going to be exactly the same as the one directly close to Jupiter. There's going to be a difference, a gradient of that force across the actual diameter of Io. So we can write it in this form here, the total force. So again, we know the tidal force varies during the orbit. So the total force, what we're going to do is we're going to work out the difference in that tidal force during half an orbital period because it's going to be at maximum and minimum over half an orbit. So the force can be determined by comparing the tidal forces at the pericenter, that's the closest distance between the two objects when it be, the tidal force will be greatest, and then at the apocenter when they are furthest away. So now we can write this difference in force, essentially as the tidal force at the pericenter minus the tidal force at the apocenter times two times the radius of Io, because that's obviously going to be the diameter. So we can get this variation in the force from that equation at the bottom there. So we already, again, know that this variation in force leads us to both a stretching and squeezing within Io's structure. So it's going to basically get stretched, then relax back to more spherical, then it gets stretched again during the orbit. So knowing that, we can then write the energy expended or the work done in this process. And it can be quantified by this equation here. So the work done, W, is equal to the force times the distance. Now, this is the distance that the rock layers are moving. So as it's being stretched, at, when the tidal force is the greatest, then the, the, the distance that the rock layers move will be D. And we already know what the force is. So we can calculate the energy expended from that. Now, what we then want to do is calculate the average power or the rate at which energy is expended during this process, essentially. So we want to do it over half the orbital period. So TIO is the orbital period. We do that over half the orbital period because that's when the variation is occurring at pericenter and apocenter. And we also want the work done on the rock over half an orbit for the same reason, basically. It's going to rise and descend over half an orbital period, okay? So that will be our average power, what we want. So observations, because we've had spacecraft there, we can actually measure the deformation on its surface. And at the surface, it rises and descends by approximately 100 meters over half its orbit. So D is then going to equal 100 meters. However, that's the surface deformation, and we can make some assumptions that actually the lower levels further down are not going to deform as much. So if we just say that let's approximate that D distance across the whole of Io, and let's just say it's going to be 50 metres as an approximation because it's not going to be at the most at the surface, it's going to be a little bit less than that. So let's say 50 metres. Now, if we then take the latest parameters of, of the Jupiter Io system as these here, and also our value for D, we can then work out what that 
average power would be over half its orbital period or during this particular process, during the tidal stretching and squeezing and the tidal heating. So we then put it all in. We end up with the variation in this force as approximately 2.657 times 10 to the 19 newtons. Putting that into the power equation, we end up with just over 1.7 times 10 to the 16 watts. And that would be the average power from the tidal heating of Io as it's on its elliptical orbit around Jupiter. So there we go. So thank you for watching. And if you find these videos helpful or useful or you just enjoy them, then do consider becoming a member. I have lots of extra videos in the member section as well as other benefits. And it also helps generally support the channel. So thank you for watching.